Hello, my name's John Mojo Mills on behalf of Cherry Red TV and Shindig Magazine. Today I'll be talking to Tim Forster about the West Coast Pop Art Experimental Band. Tim is a music historian and writer who has written for Mojo, Record Collector, Ptolemaic Terrascope and Shindig Magazine. Firstly, I'll just talk a little bit about Shindig, the magazine that I am the editor-in-chief of. We are available in WH Smith's Borders, we're available in America, we're available everywhere. www.shindig-magazine.com You can find out all you need to know about us and more at the website. And now, on to the show. Rather than discuss Shindig at length, we'll be focusing on our very popular three-part story that ran over three issues between July to December 2008. The rather wonderful and unclassifiable The West Post Pop Up, West Coast Pop Art Experimental Band. I copped name, that one up. Right, well, we thought we would do the band in the magazine because we really enjoy them. And also, they're one of these bands that have become something of a cult over the last 20 years. Reissues the CD back catalogue, and also a number of young bands, which people think of as indie and alternative, reference the band in not only their work, but they will state them as a prime influence. So having this wonderful band, which we can see on this issue here, the very first part of the three-part story, we thought this will get interest from both parties of youngsters and oldsters alike. So here we have the three-part story in Shindig, which we will be discussing with Tim. So Tim, please explain how you discovered the band and just basically explain to us why they are so important. Well, I think you've hit the nail on the head already um, if you want to ask the question why are they so obscure because the name is impossible for people to remember, um, e even uh, after you've known about them for years. Um, I was born in 68, obviously, in uh, Britain, so I can't say I ever experienced their music at first hand. Um, I, I got into them through a compilation that came out in Ed Cell back in the 80s. Bought that myself. Exactly. Um, and uh, I was intrigued by the music, but also by the sleeve notes, which heroically tried their best to tell the story. Um, but there was very little to tell. Was that Brian Hogg? It was Brian yeah. Hogg, indeed. Um, he, he, you know, he, he did the best of what he had. Um, anyway, years later, back in, in, in the mid-90s, I wrote a very small article for Mojo about the Smoke album, which was a spin-off yeah. um, involving Michael Lloyd. Mm -hmm. And um, I, one day I came home to find there was a message on my arts machine from Michael um, because he had been contacted by Kim Fowley. Um, obviously, Kim's one of those people who always spots anything that's written or said about him. And uh, I got talking to Michael and in 96 went over to Los Angeles and interviewed him in his uh, house uh, on Sunset Boulevard. And he told me the story. Um, at least he told me some of the story for the first time. Um, and I then decided that I would try and uh, write about it for Ptolemaic Terrascope. Uh, Which having... was a fanzine, wasn't it? Was it was a fanzine in the true sense of the word, yes. Um, in the way that Shindig was not in its early days. Um, I, I, my uh, ethos has always been that I want to write articles that I would like to read. But if no mm -hmm. one has written the article first, then I have to do it. Um, and because I was lucky enough through Michael to speak to the, the other living members of the band, as I thought they were at the time, uh, notably um, the two Harris brothers, um, Sean and Danny, um, and also uh, later on to the brother of Ron Morgan, um, I suddenly found out a lot more about the story, so I felt it had to be told. And uh, Ptolemaic Terrascope, if people watching this aren't aware, was wonderful. I, I originally stem from Salisbury in Wiltshire. And Ptolemaic Terrascope, uh, Phil, lived in Melksham. And it was published, essentially, by the Bevis Frond. And it was very, very inky, wasn't it? Very small print, and I don't think your feature was illustrated in much way at all, was uh, well, it? Well, it was, but not uh, by anything that came from the, the band or, or photographs. It was basically illustrated by someone's uh, little drawings. It was all very sort of amateurish, but yeah. in, a, in, a, in a very lovely Endearing way. way. Um, and uh, some uh, Dutch guy, actually, who contacted me, he ended up putting the article on the internet. Right. Um, and that's really, I think, what ultimately has led to it being um, more widely read. And from that, obviously, the Mojo piece came... 
Yes, yes, that was heavily edited um, in a way which I didn't particularly like, but for reasons that uh, will shortly become obvious. But at least it got the name yeah. out there. A, a lot of people see it. I mean, I think we've finally done it justice over the course of three magazines, and Andy Morton, who actually works for Cherry Red some of the time as a designer for Revolta, did a, a grand job with the artwork, didn't he? He did a great job, yes. I should also point out, I wrote the sleeve notes for the Sunday's reissues, at least for the three... Um, Which came out before we yeah, did this. The three reprise albums. Um, uh, they were an improvement on the Ptolemaic Terrascope article, but there were still lots of things which I found out afterwards that I wanted to include. So I was very pleased when I had the opportunity to sit down and, and write the article again from start to finish. Well, that's wonderful. And it's being republished in the annual at the moment, so it's going to run as one very lengthy continual piece which will be available for this Christmas for those of you who don't have it because these have sold out. Well, there you go. there's a good plug. I tried to make it shorter, but at the end of the day, there was uh, well, too much to yeah, say. Well, yeah, sorry, I had to cut it. I mean, <laughs> maybe Cherry Red would do a book one of these days because there is a wonderful story to be told, which I think we will kick into. Yeah, straight away, yeah. So I think you've just explained really how you found yourself becoming their unofficial biographer. You, you have all well, of un this Unofficial, knowledge. perhaps, would be a better word. But yes, I'm the only person who seems to have actually spoken to all those who are involved. Yes. Um, so, just a little bit about your love of the band. Would you say they're your favourite band or one of your favourite bands? Well, they're obviously one of my favourite bands from the 60s. I mean, I like to you know, to keep up with contemporary music. Um, there is something magical um, about them, it's an overused word, but um, uh, for a mainstream, uh, well, an album on a, on, a, on a mainstream label, as three other albums certainly were, um, for a band that recorded um, six albums in all and, and there were various spin-offs, um, they s still remained remarkably unsuccessful uh, mm. within their own time and, uh, and still obviously not very widely known to this day, although I suppose if you want to talk about cult bands, they are probably somewhere near the top of the pile. Yes, Yes, well, I think we were picked up um, your piece from Shindig by Bob Stanley in The Guardian not so long ago, wasn't it? Where, That's right, yes. yes. Where you stated them to be the number one cult band, and I think he agreed. So, so we've said it that far. Anyway, time is the essence, and this is a very long story, so sit back comfortably and uh, get your lug holes open. So, Tim, why do you think nearly 40 years after Zero Success... They've gained this degree of acclaim, which we just mentioned, that the Guardian piece giving them. Is it like a case, say, with the Velvet Underground and Love, that they've been heard by more people in the 80s than they would have the first time around? Well, that's certainly true, but unlike the Velvets, um, who you know, people like to say, I think quite rightly, um, are, are a major influence on other musicians, even mm -hmm. if they weren't commercially successful in their own time, I'm not sure you can say that about West Coast pop art. I mean, they, they obviously have influenced lots of people, but I've yet to find someone in a major band who, who cites them uh, as a great inspiration. So they definitely appeal to, you know, to the individual, to the collector, to people who uh, are enthusiastic about 60s music, whether they were actually um, around at the time or not. Um, across the, the albums, there are um, plenty of wonderful songs. Yeah fair amount of duds as well um, and they covered an enormous breadth of styles again not uncommon perhaps bands of their time but um, when they really hit the spot they hit it perfectly yeah, I think I think in a remarkable manner that that I will come to at the end of the interview but like a lot of their contemporaries which were very flowery love and peace Yes, they were, but they also sound like they're from the future. And you play the record now, say, Smell of Incense, to young, unsuspecting ears, and they could possibly think this is a recent record. You know, it's got an enduring quality, hasn't it? Yes, which I suppose is partly also because um, so many bands these days are heavily influenced by that, that sound. That's what I try and tell the kids. <laughs> OK, well, let's kick into the, uh, the, the history, really. Um, sorry I'm reading from paper everybody, I wrote this this morning and I don't have the best of memory so let me fire this one off. Something I've always found very interesting, almost as much as the music, are the members themselves. Could you just run through where they stemmed from, their backgrounds and most importantly the difference in ages between the band and their leader? We'll discuss the older guy Bob Markley in more detail later. But just to have a capsule of information pre-West Coast pop art experimental band to help the viewers get wind of this rather unusual entity. Over to you, Tim. 
Well, I suppose the story starts in 65 um, with their first album recorded uh, in 66 and released the next year. So bearing that in mind, um, three of the, the key members, um, that's Michael Lloyd um, and the two Harris brothers, were all born in the mid to late 40s. So mm-hmm. they were still in their late teens uh, by the time they actually met up with uh, with the fourth member of the band, Bob Markley. Um, he was born um, in the mid 30s. Um, and so obviously was uh, at least 10 years older than them and uh, a good deal older than people were supposed to be when they formed bands in the in the mid to late 60s. Mm-hmm. Um, later on, you get people like Ron Morgan, who became pivotal figures. And again, he was much younger than Markley. So Markley was always older than them and frankly older than most of the people he was hanging around with, to which, again, we will um, return. But um, fundamentally, um, of the younger members of the band, they were um, from Los Angeles, although the Harris brothers had travelled around the world with their uh, gifted parents. Uh, their father was a classical composer called Roy Harris. Their mother, Johanna, was um, was a, a wonderful uh, classical pianist. Um, Michael's origins somewhat humbler, it seems. Um, someone referred to him as coming from the wrong side of the tracks, but ultimately he was steeped in Los Angeles musical culture. Surf music. Uh, was in a surf band called the the New Dimensions with Jimmy Greenspoon. Uh, he was later in Three Dog Night, um, and he met the Harris brothers um, when they all went to the Hollywood Professional School in in the early sixties. Which um, uh, it's not quite like the kids from Fame, but it was certainly a school which was more liberal um, mm-hmm. than most. Perhaps um, it was filled with the offspring of uh, often wealthy uh, my parents, not necessarily all, but um, people who had a very um, diverse musical background. So that's where they were in uh, 65 um, when they were invited to this uh, extraordinary party at which the Yardbirds were going to play. Um, now, that really is the catalyst that began the West Coast pop art experimental band story. Um, the uh, the younger uh, boys, uh, Lloyd and the Harris brothers, they were big Yardbirds fans. They had their own band, uh, The Laughing Wind, uh, and Lloyd himself, with Kim Fowley, um, another important figure from the scene, uh, had recorded all sorts of, of, of music and released quite a few records. Um, they went to that party because Kim Fowley got them an invite. Mm-hmm. Um, Kim Fowley had organised a party. And whose house was the party at? And the house was in... Um, the Bob Markley's uh, house was where the party took place. Um, the Arbos couldn't play live because they hadn't got work permits, right. uh, and so their manager, Georgia Kamelski, was looking around for somewhere for them to play. So they end up in this living room uh, of this quite smart house um, up in... Uh, Beverly Hills, uh, playing before an invited audience who, by all accounts, included uh, a lot of very uh, important people yes. in the Los Angeles music scene. And at some point during the party, this is agreed, um, Kim Fowley introduced Bob Markley to the younger, uh, the teenagers, the Harris brothers and Lloyd, and something clicked at that point. Um, they say that they were attracted by his obvious wealth uh, and all these starlets and contacts that he had. Um, undoubtedly, he was attracted by the fact that they were young musicians uh, already in a band, uh, and he suddenly thought, well, I'll get a piece of that. And I suppose it must be said that at this period, really pre-hippie era, there was quite a divide, wasn't there, between the starlets and the successful people who would have been short-haired and suited... And then these swinging stars from London, the Yardbirds, with Keith Ralph's long hair, which, of course, all the teenagers wanted to adopt. And I suppose Bob Markley saw this as, this is the way forward. Yesterday's gone. Undoubtedly. But um, although at the beginning of this story, um, the way I used to tell it, um, it seemed as if Markley had suddenly had some sort of um, um, huge uh, musical um, uh, happening to his, you know, where he suddenly thought, I, I, I must get aboard the uh, the pop uh, yeah. music bandwagon. That's actually not true because, mm-hmm. um, as it, it turned out, he had his own mm-hmm. label. In fact, at least uh, two labels that he'd been running since the early 60s. Small labels, yes. obviously, putting yes. out singles here and there. Uh, the FIFO label, it was called. Yes. Um, and uh, so he was, you know, he was very active in, in the music scene. Uh, long before he met up with um, with Lloyd uh, and the Harris brothers. But it has to be said that none of the music he had recorded before then, even though some of it was quite strange uh, and interesting in its own way, was anything like the music he was about to start recording. It's the picture uh, of him in the magazine. If I can just try and shuffle the way and get it on the camera, we, we, we see the, the, the sort of divide I mentioned. I, I think it was just the end of that era, wasn't it, at the... Uh, time if you can see here 
Bob Markley has a, a quiff and a sort of Fabian look to him, which of course was very, very different than a couple of years down the line. I mean, things were changing very quickly, weren't they? They were, yes, absolutely. But there was nothing strange uh, about people of Marker's age, someone who must have been then in his um, uh, early 30s, suddenly growing their hair and, and getting hip. Yeah. Um, and that's pretty much what I think he was already doing um, yes. before he decided to link up with the others. OK. Uh, another character, you, you briefly mentioned the uh, huckster supremo, Kim Fowley, who I've had the pleasure of... Uh, <laughs> Talking to on the phone for four hours one night. I mean, it's a man to talk to him for less than yeah, four hours. I can, I can testify to that. A man stories. Um, just you know, he is. I think he's important for this group as he is for many. Just briefly, if you can, in a couple of minutes, just what was magical about Fowley. Well, I mean, Kim's story has been told by many people, uh, most, um, mostly, of course, by himself. Um, <laughs> he's one of the few people about whom you can say that, that his own hype is, is pretty much justified because he had his fingers in almost every pie, yeah. uh, and not just in America, but he came over to Britain and was that's very influential, yeah. and that's how he met up with the Yardbirds, um, and, and he uh, recorded uh, and produced a, a lot of artists over here. Um, so he was a very important figure, and it's, and it's no surprise that when George Kamelski found himself in Los Angeles with the Yardbirds, without work permits, that it was to Fowley that he turned for help. And Fowley was definitely the man to, 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 to sort him out. But on the other hand, Fowley was the sort of person who would also have known people like Markley, and did know mm -hmm. Markley, and mm -hmm. had met him just some years the before. Thing, just... Well, he, yes, I mean, I think they shared the same uh, lawyer, although Markley himself was qualified as a lawyer. Um, but they met because they were both um, movers and shakers, uh, or, or wealthy people, I suppose, in, in Los Angeles at that time. Um, so, yes, I mean, Fowley was the person who introduced one half of the band to the other. I wouldn't say that he had a great deal to do with the, what, what shaped them after that. No, um, no, just a sort of meeting point. Yeah, which is, which is what he did best. And we've spoken a little bit about the enigmatic older guy, Bob Markley, uh, and his musical background, you know, the FIFO label, as you said, it was a small label. It, it, was, it was a Fabian-type music, right? But his strange lyrical presence was not quite formed, but it it was beginning to, to show. He wasn't Joe Meek, but he was no. a bit more eccentric than the average... Uh, sort of Bobby Sox crooner, right? Yeah, yes. I, I, mean, I should have said that, that uh, he came from Tulsa, um, Oklahoma, and he was at Oklahoma University. Um, came to um, uh, Los Angeles after he'd already been the MC on, on the Oklahoma Bandstand, right, which was yeah. clearly a very successful television series locally. Um, he came, uh, according to the sleeve notes on the back of his first single, and also to Fowley, um, because he wanted to be an actor. Um, he did appear at least in, in one film in a very small role. Uh, he also uh, raced... Um, uh, dragster um, cars and um, and did various other things that people with lots of money had because, as it turned out, he was adopted by an oil um, millionaire. He he was loaded basically, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but uh, something about his early singles or, or singles that he co-wrote or produced um, for his own labels, FIFO and, and RHM, um, was decidedly odd um, for its for its time. Um, there's something slightly dark, something mm -hmm. slightly comic, mm -hmm. um, almost a little bit like those sort of cartoons that we all know from Hanna Barbera. That, those kind of uh, voices that yes. he he seemed to adopt. Yes. Um, although he could sing when he wanted to. Yes. Um, but the the thing that people keep saying about Markley is that he wasn't musical, which in yeah. a sense is true uh -huh. because he didn't write music. No. He couldn't come up with a melody, but he obviously wrote lyrics and he did know something. And when he found the right people to work with, then he could do something quite interesting. Which I think will bring us on to the formation of the West Coast Pop Art Experimental Band. Absolutely. Yes. How do you think he initially shaped the younger musicians? Well, uh, again, this is a matter of intense debate amongst the people I've spoken to. Um, according to the younger members of the band, um, he had very little to do with their very first album. And in fact, their first album, um, properly called, wasn't even known about until relatively recently. This is the somewhat legendary FIFO it's LP. It's a wonderful record. Um, it is a wonderful record. I have the um, Sunday's reissue from, what, ten years ago with the yeah. later material. Yeah, well, the Sunday's reissue uh, does include the whole original album, yeah. but, but it mixes it up with some other tracks which uh, were recorded later on, and so it's difficult to divine to the, yes. from that CD precisely what this first record was. It was um, certainly quite lo-fi by comparison with a 
later works, but it showcased some extraordinary um, yeah. musicianship, especially Lloyd's guitar playing. Yeah. I mean, he was a fantastic lead guitarist. Yeah. Um, also a great singer because he sings songs on that album, which uh, he doesn't sing on, on part one. There's sort of study uh, Holly record. inflection and yeah. garage band angst, but also that beautiful sound which we associate with the West Coast Pop Art Experimental Band, even amongst the sort of lo-fi, almost avant-garde dissonant sort of approach, which... Is that amateurish or intentional? <laughs> I don't know. Well, I, I, I don't think I'd call it amateurish. I mean, they were young and they were yeah, experimenting. 17, 18, um, yeah. yeah, they were clearly feeding off all of these sounds, uh, like the Yardbirds and the, and the Kinks. Um, and they were sometimes uh, covering songs, sometimes recording their own songs, but mixing things which were obviously steals from, from better known records. Um, but amongst this record, you do get some absolutely beautiful uh, original songs. Um, now, Mark Lee almost certainly had very little to do with the sound of this record. So he just instigated um, the band rather than have his yeah, power exactly. at this time. Yeah, um, exactly. And uh, originally, I, I mistakenly said that he sang uh, on Don't Break My Balloon, which is certainly yeah. one of the less interesting yeah. songs. That wasn't him, as it happens. Right. It was someone called Dennis Lambert, um, who was also involved in the band. Um, and this is this is a very odd LP because it was basically a, a sort of private press. I mean, okay. Fifer was a label, but it's the yes. only album that was ever released and on, the on last this label. Fifer record. It, it was yes, and uh, a few copies came with this rather crude, sort of paste on sleeve. Um, the reason this one looks so strange is because it was passed around amongst various, well, groupies is not quite the right word, but um, just to say female admirers of the band, um, and they basically scribbled all sorts of graffiti on it, um, some of which is quite uh, flattering. Apparently, bitching is the highest accolade that uh, a teenage girl in Los Angeles could pay a male musician. Um, elsewhere, it's slightly less than complimentary. Uh, it also lists all sorts of supposed lineups of the band, because um, bear in mind this is obviously a record that was passed around over the course of perhaps a year or two, um, one of which actually claims that Jeff Beck uh, was a member. Whether that's uh, actually <laughs> true or not is hard to say. Clearly, obviously he was in Los Angeles at the time, yeah. and uh, he was in the same room where the band were oh, created. I, I think it stands up. If you, I think you... If anyone's new to the West Coast Pop Art Experimental Band, it's the last record to come to, I would say. But if you've digested their catalogue, I think you can get quite a lot from it, can't you? Yes. I mean, it was a first... Uh, ironically, it was the first one to be properly reissued by Sundays. Um, so I think people rushed to it, um, yes. looking for some sort of holy grail. Yes. Now, depending on, on what you like about Sixes music, if you're a garage fan, yeah. then you're going to love it. Yeah. But if you came to it expecting the sort of things they were going to achieve later on, then um, you're probably going to be slightly disappointed. Yes. Um, I think, I think it's a interesting record. It is, and and you know, as I also said, if they never released another album, this would be classic. Yeah, um, a classic. It's a of its good type. garage band album, isn't it? It, it is, and because it's incredibly rare, uh, no doubt that would uh, enhance its reputation. But anyway, luckily for us, they, they went on to produce uh, several more records. So, um, what's in a name? The West Coast Pop Art Experimental Band. Well, yes, apart from it being a mouthful, it, it has to be one of the most literal uh, band names of all time. I mean, obviously, those of us who deal in obscure sixes music know there were lots of other ridiculous band names, um, some quite uh, funny, some less so. Um, I won't run through those now, but uh, it is, I think, almost uniquely, actually, a, a very accurate description mm. of, of the mm. band. I mean, bearing in mind that, you know, that great groups would give themselves names like the Beatles or Traffic or whatever, mm. which don't really suggest anything about the sound. Here you have uh, a name which tells you they are from the West Coast, Czech. Um, pop, certainly they are to a certain point, although it's pro probably pop art, which is supposed to be uh, that part of the name. That uh, betrayed uh, a Warhol influence, yes. which is certainly clear from some of their later records. Um, experimental, undoubtedly they yes. were. Yes. Um, everyone seems to blame Markley for coming up with the name. Um, but It, it uh, sounds less strange today than it probably did then, because experimental is, I think, if you go to iTunes or a record shop, it, we have it as a genre now. You know, magazines yeah. like The Wire dedicate themselves to it. Then it wasn't a genre, was it? Uh, no, no. This, this was a name that, that seemed to announce that this was uh, a group that were trying something different. I, I mean, obviously as we'll come to at the moment, Frank Zappa and the Mothers of Invention yes. were already um, pioneers in the, in the same uh, field, um, but there were some interconnections which we'll discuss. Yes. And the Velvet Underground, uh, the, the early 
period when they came to the Sunset Strip. Did this play a role at this time, or was that oh, slightly later? Well, no, no, no. I, um, well, perhaps not by the time of the FIFO album, but certainly uh, in that year, um, the FIFO album was was released in '66. Um, the the Velvets came to um, Sunset Strip with Warhol's exploding plastic inevitable. Absolutely. Uh, Warhol uh, was uh, very very much in vogue. There were some quite hip galleries that were showing some of his works, like Silver Pillows. Um, and it's uh, unquestionable that Mark Clear especially was very taken with Warhol. Whether he liked him because of his uh, art or because of the fact that he was famous uh, is hard to say. Perhaps it was a mixture of both. How did they then end up? on the high-profile reprise records after these humble beginnings. And and perhaps before they ended on reprise, what was their... the, the build-up to the signing? Were they playing with big bands around LA? Were they having a strong following or, or not particularly? Well, they were playing with lots of big bands. Um, they were on a circuit um, from uh, 66 onwards, uh, playing alongside bands like The Seeds. Um, mm -hmm. Interestingly, The Seeds are, are name-checked on the cover of this album, on in graffiti at least. Um, they were playing alongside The Mothers of Invention, um, The Count Five. Um, I mean, almost any of those sort of bands that you care to mention, they were all playing at the same time. So they were very much on the scene. Yeah. Um, Mark Lee, uh, of course, had his own uh, way of getting to know people. He was an extremely good tennis player. Um, having won awards at university uh, and played tennis with Jack Warner, which was a very useful contact to have since Jack Warner actually owned Warner Brothers. So one can see that there was a, an element of Mark Lee invading himself with people like Jack Warner and perhaps dropping the fact that he actually had a band and maybe they should sign them. The fact that they already had an album that was actually out on, on the streets, albeit in limited quantities, but he could at least hand it over and say, mm -hmm. here we are. Um, and uh, and ultimately, perhaps a bit of uh, Kim Fowler's influence. Who knows? But generally speaking, reprise at that time, or reprise as Americans like to call the label, um, were certainly in the market for some interesting music. Electric Prunes. Uh, Electric Prunes, uh, whose debut album was released uh, almost concurrently with mm -hmm. uh, the first uh, West Coast pop art album on that label. Um, and, and later on, bands like The Fugs. Yeah. Um, not uh, very Frank Sinatra. No, no, it, it's extraordinary now to realise that Frank Sinatra was still effectively in charge of the label, although yeah. one suspects he didn't have much to, to do with the day-to-day -day running of it. No. Um, but Mark Lee, especially because he ran in, in these rather wealthy um, society um, circles, uh, you know, he frequented clubs that were frequented by actors uh, mm -hmm. and important people. Um, places like you know, The Other Half uh, and The Daisy, where they uh, played live gigs. And so I think that combination of factors meant that... Um, he was in the sort of yeah, media circle. Reprise got excited about them. Yeah. Um, and they were prepared to sign them for what seems to be a three-album deal. Right. Um, and Mark is certainly to be thanked for that. Brilliant. I mean, that's, that's something he must be thanked for. I think... As the story goes along, we'll discover that maybe, particularly the band members, have a lot less to thank him for. But but with the sort of marketing, the, the astute business acumen, he was the tops. Uh, yes, he, he certainly had a, um, a, an eye for that. The official album, the debut, Volume 1, as, it, as it's called, is a musically rich effort with an amazing production. But I believe frustration was growing early on in the ranks... What was, the, what was the hierarchy of the group at this time and what do you think caused the young guys, Michael Lloyd in particular, to grow frustrated with the ego of Bob Markley? Yes, well, it's, it's actually part one, uh, confusingly. Volume one was the FIFO album. Part, part one. one is the debut on the reprise label. Um, well, um, again, it depends who you talk to. Um, undoubtedly, um, Michael Lloyd was still a very important member of the band. Um, he plays on a lot of the uh, tracks in his album. Um, he co-writes some of them, although his credits are, are, are very few. Um, and the way I see it, he, he and Mark Lee were probably effectively uh, in, um, in conflict right from the start because they were both very ambitious people. Um, I, I don't want to denigrate the involvement of the Harris brothers at all, but... Uh, I, I get the feeling they took more of a back seat when it came to decision-making, even though, obviously, they made significant uh, musical contributions. Now, you reach a point in the recording of this album, which um, it seems it was recorded sometime in, in late 1966, even though it wasn't released until February of the following year, uh, where Michael Lloyd simply had enough. 
Um, there was an argument, uh, a fight, it depends on who you talk to, um, and he left, uh, having already contributed some of the uh, lead guitar and, and some of the backing vocals, although none of the lead vocals to this record. And in his place um, came a person who's been overlooked, um, certainly was overlooked for many years, called uh, Ron Morgan, um, who was from Colorado. Mm -hmm. um, he came into the group at that point, and that's when photographs start to appear in the local press with him as part of the lineup. And he was equally as significant as a member of the band as, as any of the others, right, yeah. um, both in writing classic songs like Smell of Incense um, and As the World Rises and Falls, and also as a fantastic lead guitar player. Absolutely. But back to the first album. Yeah. You state that this album, part one, flits somewhere between the old school and the future. Yet, even on the straighter cover songs, If You Want This Love and Shifting Sands, the group somehow seemed to subvert them into ghostly, ethereal pop with a dreamy feel, the exact approach that would become synonymous with so many 80s indie bands. How do you think the West Coast pop art experimental band viewed themselves with what they were trying to do? Well, um, it's worth pointing out that of the 11 tracks on this album, uh, only five were actually written by the band. Indeed. So that's you know more, yeah. more covers than originals. Um, I think partly they needed to choose cover versions because um, they perhaps didn't have enough material, but also because I think it helped them um, get signed to reprise if they were able to pitch a record which had lots of uh, known songwriters on it. So um, you have, um, of the old school, uh, as you mentioned, people like Baker Knight, who, mm -hmm. who wrote both um, uh, If You Want This Love, um, and Shifting Sands, um, he had written songs for uh, Ricky Nelson, uh, would later write uh, songs for Elvis Presley. Uh, he also wrote Frank Sinatra. So he, he, and he was someone that Mark Lee clearly knew because they had co-written stuff together on the FIFO label. Um, you also had uh, an interesting song by Bob Johnston, um, later, of course, to produce um, Bob Dylan, Excuse Me, Miss Rose. And then you had the sort of younger... Um, Hip songwriters like P.F. Sloan, uh, Here's Where You Belong. Van Dyke Parks. Van Dyke Parks, High Coin, although he's on record as uh, positively hating the yeah. West Coast Pop Arts version of uh, that song. Uh, and lastly, of course, you had um, the obvious influence of uh, Frank Zappa with uh, Help, I'm a Rock. Absolutely. A, a definitive version, really. Not so different, but probably even more strange than Zappa's. Yes. As time's yes. passing, I, I, I'm, yeah. I'm going to get moving. Absolutely. But I'm going to give you a... A hard question, which I think will help with the end of the interview. How would you describe part one? Because I think the remaining albums are in the in the similar sort of genre. How would you describe it to the uninitiated, in case people out here haven't got a clue what we're talking about? Well, it's um, it's a very mixed record. Um, inconsistent in terms of styles, although I think it's consistently um, accomplished. Um, once you know the story, perhaps it's easier to understand, but I'm, I've always uh, portrayed it as um, teenage dreams diverted because you've got, basically, a young, energetic band who are suddenly unleashed in, in a major studio on their first major recording, and they really want to have you know, the best go that they can. Mm -hmm. At the same time, you've got this guy, Mark Lee, who's much older, who's writing these lyrics that few of them seem to understand, mm -hmm. um, who's taking them in a direction that they don't seem to want to go in. So you've got this, this conflict, and you know we all know that, um, that bands who have a conflict um, can often record great records. You know, like the Birds, for example, on Notorious Bird Brothers. Yes. Um, of course, I imagine there are far more records recorded by bands in conflict, which are absolutely rubbish. Yes. But, but when it works, when the it, tension seems to work the right way, then, then it, 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 it does work. The birds are there, aren't they? I mean, we've got that sort of monast mon monastic vocal harmonies, very boyish and actually not monastic, more choir boy, this youthful sound, but quite low in the mix. That's why I mention indie music. It, it sounds very <clears throat> forward-thinking. It doesn't sound like the Birds or the Velvet Underground or Zappa, but there's sort of elements, but it's... It's not like that, is it? Yeah. Well, you've got, you know, you've almost got two or three records in one here. You've, you've got some fantastic um, sort of sunshine pop song, songs like Transparent Day and, and uh, P.F. Sloan's Here's Where You Belong. Um, you've got some pretty raucous uh, rock, like Excuse Me, Miss Rose, um, country, if that's the right yeah. word. Um, Early country rock, really, uh, isn't it? In, in, in a way. And then you've got these, these three songs that, that really stand out. Um, 1906, um, which is a, a Markley Morgan composition. 
which is completely bonkers, really. I mean, it's ostensibly about a, a dog, um, a dog's premonition of an earthquake. But uh, it's frightening. It's, uh, it's an early psychedelic nightmare. It is. Um, it also, as I found out more recently, steals a lot of lyrics or words from um, J.R. Tolkien. Um, clearly, Markley was reading at least the first few chapters of The Hobbit. Um, Lots of people. And, were, but this uh, is quite early, isn't it? it it's pretty yeah. hippie. He was obviously yeah. digesting. It before many others. Yeah, exactly, and there are even more diverse influences than that on 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 Layla, um, and obviously Help My Rock, which is the Zappa cover. But um, those songs sort of do sit slightly uneasily with with the rest of it. But I, to me, that makes it very interesting, especially as they're all mixed in, as if yes. anyone should expect just to leap from one extreme to the other. And why it, not? There's yeah? a sort of cohes- cohesive whole to the whole thing, even though it jars. It, it you can tell it's one band. Exactly, and it also has a, a stunning cover, which was clearly designed to look like their light show. And on the back of the cover, you've got photographs taken from them playing uh, a gig at the uh, the other place. Anyway, part one. And the second album, we do go back to being called Volume Two, don't we? We are now on Volume Two, hence my confusion earlier. Uh, yes, yes. Now this was released not that much later, was it? October '67. Uh, and it's yep. an even stranger record, isn't it? It still sounds unlike anything else to this day to me. The production, tight, crisp, compressed, the vocals veering from the, the choir boy, which we spoke about, to Markley's barked raps that I believe he did through a megaphone, and they're quite petrifying. Yeah, well, here you've also got um, the fact that there's a, there's a real engineer on, on board. Um, this is uh, Joe Siddall. Um, the first album was ostensibly produced by Jimmy Bowen, who was Frank Sinatra's producer, although he doesn't seem to have actually done much uh, in, in, in a hands-on way. Yeah. Um, but along comes Joe Siddall, who had also engineered things like The Count Five, Psychotic right. Reaction, and The Seas Pushing Too Hard. Um, he's someone I only tracked down quite recently. Um, so he comes in to engineer this band, who ostensibly are still produced by Jimmy Bowen, and this time with Bob Markley. Um, and he's a very seasoned guy, uh, and he's very shocked by what he discovers. Basically, um, Markley will come into the studio at the allotted time. Um, the others will show up um, often hours late. Uh, Markley will start writing lyrics uh, on the sound desk there in the studio, and then when the band come in, he will basically kind of tell them what he wants them to do. Um, He was horrified, because it was clear to him that, uh, as he put it, Markley had no chops. He wasn't a musician. He didn't really know what he was doing. But somehow, despite that, he actually did get things done. Um, And one of the, the inspired things that he did was to come into the studio one day with a with a megaphone or bullhorn um and decide that he was going to start shouting the lyrics to uh, yeah. in the arena through through that um joe siddall did what he was told and uh, i think it works and don't you think marky smith took a, a major leaf out of that and a lot of these later pioneers of the sort of abstract it's it's clear it's it's, it's quite possible yeah and it's also a much more political album um it, 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 as it says on the back cover, you know, it hasn't been censored. Everything they wanted to say is in the record. Um, it's not clear if anyone was actually trying to stop them anyway. But uh, you have these songs like Suppose They Give a War and No One Comes, mm-hmm. uh, which was later used as a title for a film. Um, it's, a, it's, a very, um, it's a very funny uh, song, I think. It's not a humorous song, but it's, no. um, there is something... Um, slightly uh, edgy about it yes. um, and the uh, the presentation is just extraordinary I well, mean indeed the production the way everything shifts around and, and the moods it, it, it's cinematic music before many people were doing that you know the, the atmosphere it creates yes yes and I think this is also uh, a result of the fact that they were playing live a lot more and they also had different people um, coming into the band um, if you saw the West Coast Pop Art Experimental Band playing live at that time uh, you could be sure perhaps of one thing that's as Markley would be there somewhere shaking a tambourine but, uh, exactly but, uh, and, and, and singing but Lloyd had, uh, had gone mm-hmm. uh, the Harris Brothers didn't always seem to turn up uh, and you have people like uh, Bob Yazel um, who came in who's a friend of Ron Morgan's to play uh, with him um, so it was, it was a, a sort of shifting band anyway from the, the, the group that recorded the first record. I think I can safely say that from this album, it was released as a single as well, I believe, Smell of Incense may just be the greatest psychedelic 45 of the era. Would you agree? Well, yes and no. Unfortunately, the 45 was um, the victim of an appalling edit. Um, it was just too long to mm-hmm. put into a single. So uh, a bit like um, The Doors Light My Fire, it was just cut down. 
um, and so the single I don't like at all. But as as a uh, as a, the sort of ultimate psychedelic pop song, yes, um, because it is very catchy, um, with fantastic lyrics. It's very druggy um, uh, and beautiful at the same time. Uh, I think it takes a, a lot to beat. And you mentioned the Doors. I, I always try and think when I hear it, what can you compare it with from that era? The I sometimes get the association. Pandora's Golden Heebie Jeebies. It, it's because it's quite popish, isn't it? Yes. Well, um, it's not dark like the Doors, for instance. Uh, well, there is some darkness in it, but I don't think it, it's um, it like weighs more... quite so heavily yeah. uh, as as um, as some of their lyrics. Um, but you you mentioned uh, the associations, um, Pandora's Golden Heebie Jeebies. That was obviously uh, an influence because yes. that's the first documented use of the Japanese harp, the koto. Yes. Um, and it was recorded and released uh, a few months before this album, and maybe uh, it was actually recorded about the same time. The, uh -huh. the two bands were certainly playing with each other. Uh, and the koto is a very striking instrument, and, and it's uh, when you actually hear it used properly, and I use that term advisedly because it wasn't played anything like a Japanese uh, classical musician would play it, though it was actually a genuine um, Japanese uh, woman who, uh, musician who played it. But the way in which it uh, complements um, Buddha uh, and smell of incense uh, is extraordinary. I mean, it's not a sound that you've ever heard before, no. um, apart from on the association, uh, as I've, I've already mentioned. I'll return to it again. I think this record, if you play it at a club with young people in... Or you just played it to a friend, unsuspecting, amongst current music. It's not really going to turn her head, saying, what's all this old hippie rubbish? It is it is part of that, but it's not as well. Yeah, and Buddha, I think in particular, sounds very modern. Um, some, yes. Somebody said that it sounds a, little, like, a bit like the B-52s. Um, yeah. uh, maybe it was an influence to them, yeah. I, I don't know. But um, it's, uh, yeah, it's very sort of catchy, edgy music. Well, I just want to touch on something quickly. Um... It's a bit darker. Um, I don't know if people have read the feature here or if they've read the Sunday's liners or anything on forums on the internet, but if you listen to the records, Mark Lee often used the imagery and themes of childhood innocence. In this fearful era in which we live today, his lyrics maybe are a little bit easy to misconstrue. And Sean Harris is quoted in your article as saying, if Mark Lee was obsessed with children... It wasn't in a positive way. It's not that nice, really. But as the band's records continue, it does become more apparent. And the deeper you listen, the more you find a perverse edge in, in what's essentially sweet music. Without getting too deep, Tim, and avoiding the possibility of making unjust accusations. How do you perceive this? Yes, well, obviously one has to be careful what one says, but um, I suppose this leads us inevitably to the the fourth album, or the, the third for Reprise, which was A Child's Guide to Good and Evil. Um, one of the finest covers it's um, of, of it? its uh, era uh, alone, but, but a very disturbing image. Um, mm. You've got the face of a child, although, as it turns out, it was actually uh, a woman. Um, John Van Hammersveld, the designer, uh, used a photograph of a friend of his with this butterfly mind, so it, it's supposed to be, a, I suppose, an image of, of liberation, um, mm -hmm. but also there's something very, very dark and sinister mm -hmm. about it, not just about that it's obviously black and white. Um, and on this record, you suddenly... Well, not suddenly, it's gradual, but the lyrics um, and the song titles become uh, a little bit more obviously about uh, children or um, childhood fantasies uh, or nightmares. Um, some of the lyrics are a little bit like Alice in Wonderland yeah. or the tales of the Brother Grimm. Um, and the title track alone um, is uh, one of the most, um, well, I, I keep using the word extraordinary, but that perhaps I'm overusing it. Um, there is something just totally unique uh, about a, a song which narrates through Markler's um, rather uh, odd singing, um, uh, an adult, it seems, uh, taking a, a child, perhaps, through a dark wood. Uh, being bitten by rabid dogs and, and bats, um, but nothing will matter. Mm. It's so you, you've got a, an image of absolute horror, and yet you've got this sort of crazy voice reassuring you that everything's going to be okay. And as a song fades into distance... Is he a distance, wolf or is well, <laughs> he a guiding light? Yeah, um, I, I, I know. Um, some of it's clearly... Uh, directed towards the Vietnam War, um, and so you have uh, a child of a few hours is burning to death. The picture. 
Um, yes. Now, people perhaps will make that connection themselves that um, it's in a song which talks about um, napalm, uh, napalming children. You have the the classic, iconic photograph from the Vietnam War, I do have uh, it taken by I think by Nick Ut, uh, which is credited uh, by lots of people with actually bringing the war to a conclusion, but. That photograph was actually taken about three years later. I mean, I think 71. Um, yes. So there's no question that that was an influence on Markley's lyrics. Right, no. Um, so I'm afraid one has to say that he was remarkably prescient um, in choosing that as, as, as an image. It's a very small picture, isn't yeah. it? But it's a little naked girl running a bone. You've seen it on the internet. It's not very pleasant. But as Tim said, Markley hadn't seen that. But... It does point towards it, doesn't it? It points to the future. Yes. Um, another song which is uh, clearly about childhood and loss of innocence um, is As the World Rises and Falls. Um, another song written uh, essentially by Markley and Morgan, um, beautifully played. Uh, it's a, it's a, 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 a very um, a haunting and hypnotic song. Um, but the lyrics... Uh, are all about um, an encounter between, it seems, a boy and uh, a girl on, on a beach, and it's looking towards their, their future and their destiny. And the boy is warning the girl uh, that she will be tricked by, by somebody who, who's clearly not her best influence. Um, and he's warning her about that. Now, whether or not Markley sees himself as, as the child or as the person that he's warning the girl about, or both, it's hard to say. Um, if one just looks at it purely as a song, it's it's breathtaking, yes. um, and um, incidentally, um, undoubtedly, a very large influence on Julian Cope. Yes, um, Search Party on Fried is clearly <laughs> based upon the same chord progressions. Um, of course, Julian Cope um, has uh, been a big fan of this band for many years. So, if you're watching Julian, Tim's been watching you. <clears throat> um. <laughs> The third album followed not so long afterwards, July 68, A Child's Guide to Good and Evil. So this theme, which you've just been developing, yeah. grows and grows. And we've just seen the cover. Um, you know, as you said, there's an ongoing focus on innocence and malice. Talk us through the album as you've just... Well, sorry, everybody. Tim's just done that. Look, we're running out of time. If you're still watching this and your eyes are open, let's cut to the chase and move on. The band get dropped from Reprise after this album. As uh, Tim said, they initially signed up as a, a three-album deal and clearly the records weren't selling, were they, Tim? Uh, no, no. Although they were clearly pressed in, in large quantities. Um, all of the Reprise albums are very easy to find. Um albeit perhaps not in, in perfect condition. Um, and I, it, I just don't know what the sales figures were, but um, they get some positive reviews here and there, but they don't seem to show up uh, very clearly on, on the radar at the time, uh, even though they were actually released in, in many different countries. Um, but uh, commercially, they were undoubtedly uh, a, a failure. Um, so they were dropped like a hot cake. They were dropped or their uh, contract wasn't renewed. Who knows? But um, it's no coincidence that the next label they moved to... Um, was uh, Amos, which was run by Jimmy Bowen. So, right. yet again, Back again, the reprise producer, Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, etc. Maybe he just said to them, hey guys, why don't you come and uh, and uh, record for my new label? That may have been what happened, because uh, I think their album was the second release on the label. And the first one was? Oh, you're going you're gonna to have to remind me, but uh, something which is... It was some crooner, wasn't it? it? Yes, it was. was I... it, um... Well, it was a crooner. But, yeah. but the cover... Goes even a step further, doesn't it? If, if Tim's just going to show this to you, uh, we, we didn't really want to try and get too explicit about the, the imagery created. And Tim actually has a, an interesting story about this sleeve. But to a modern-day contemporary person looking at this, there's something a little bit sinister. But what did you recently well, discover? I mean, here you have an album called Where's My Daddy? And you have a picture on the front, which is a, of a, clearly of a prepubescent girl. Um, maybe she's uh, 11, uh, who knows? And she's sitting uh, on a, a bench um, near a beach, it seems, with a doll and a crumpled beer can. Um, so I've always assumed that the title was supposed to be her speaking. And sure enough, the same girl, who I have actually um, spoken to, um, is the girl you can hear speaking uh, on the record, introducing it. Um, but... Uh, recently I've been in contact with one of Markler's relatives and um, because he, he was adopted and it seems almost certain now that he was an orphan 
Um, and a lot of the lyrics, as we've already discussed, are concerned with childhood and the loss of childhood innocence. You might see this actually as Markley's question mm -hmm. uh, about his own predicament. And the girl, perhaps, uh, as somebody who he puts in the same position uh, as himself. Um, you might say that. Yes. On, on the other hand, um, because uh, undoubtedly Markley did have an obsession for young yes. girls, there's, there's no other way of looking at it, you might see it as being the other or perhaps both. It is, however, a very disturbing uh, cover and a very disturbing record. Yeah, not... I mean, uh, it's not their best, but <laughs> I, their best. I like it. My dog back home... Lloyd returned, hasn't he? Beautiful yes, he has. Song. Yeah, um, this is the, this is the thing. Lloyd leaves the band halfway through part one. Um, he's nowhere near um, volume two um, or a child's guide, and then suddenly he turns up again on this this album. Now, he's not pitched on the back, um, but he is credited with some of the songs, and you can clay, uh, clearly uh, clearly hear his his um, influence, his arrangements. Um, and it's a much cleaner LP in, mm. in, in many ways. I'm not sure it's better for that. Mm. Uh, there's, it's not very echoey. It's, it's all rather stripped down and bare. Um, I suspect it was recorded uh, in a hurry. On a budget. Uh, with very little rehearsal. Um, it's certainly as disturbing lyrically as the other records, but I don't know, for my money, not in so, such an interesting way. No, he, I think disturbing and maybe disturbed come into play here because uh, Sean Harris, you, you quoted as saying, Mark Lee was getting into a dark place. Uh, yes. Um, again, this is a story which is too long to tell here, but um, he plainly ha hadn't achieved the, the fame uh, and respect, perhaps, which he thought was his due. Um, mm -hmm. If he got into this whole music game because he wanted to be successful... Um, and who knows whether it was fame or, or adulation he craved. It can't have been money because he clearly wasn't hard up at this time. Uh, it, it's impossible to say. But somehow uh, he started to lose his way. He moved down to the beach. Um, according to Fowley, he started dressing rather scruffily. And, he looks uh, weightier as well, doesn't he? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, and he was uh, walking around the beach with, um, with these dogs, um, picking up girls. Um, again, that's documented. I've spoken to some other than myself, although they don't seem to have any regrets now about what happened. Um, he had became a sort of beatnik character. Mm -hmm. Maybe he decided to reinvent himself. But musically, it wasn't as interesting. No, but not bad. Worth inspecting. I think there's something in all of the albums. that There's, you know, there's a sort of country rock feel, maybe in places where they were trying to move closer to the prevalent sound of LA, where bands like Poco were coming up. It's like... We've done this thing, what do we do now? Hence, struggling a little bit, perhaps. Yes. But I mean, it wasn't over yet, was no, it? No, no. I mean, perhaps you're hearing a band with the weight of records behind them, as opposed to other bands on the same label, like uh, Long Branch, Penny Whistle, and Shiloh, uh, both of whom contain future members of the Eagles, who were just starting out yes. and making their tentative first steps. Here was a band, of course, who had already been around for, you know, three or four years by the time they recorded this record. Uh, luckily, it wasn't the last word. No, I mean, why did, in 1969, it was 1969, wasn't it, a group by Bob Markley? Uh, is it seems like 1970. 1970? Yeah. So, shortly after <clears throat> the, the fourth album, yeah. the band are over, or so we presume, yeah. Bob Markley's solo album, a group, is... Basically consists of um, the West Coast Pop Art Experimental Band. Yeah, I'm, I, for, to my mind, it's it's actually a return to form. Um, it's been obviously a source of much confusion over the years because it is credited as a Bob Markley solo mm. record, and yet on the back of it, I don't have one to hand here. You get pictures of uh, Lloyd and the Harris brothers as well as Markley. Um, I should point out that Ron Morgan, who was such a mainstay of um, the Reprise records, had by now effectively um, left the picture. Um, so you've got reassembled the a little bit older but the younger uh, band members together with Mark Lee and I think they recapture some of the magic which they first um, had on, on their FIFO debut and especially on part one and a lot of that is down to Lloyd yeah. because his arrangements especially his uh, orchestral arrangements are exquisite um, a lot of it's down to um, to Danny Harris, despite the fact that he had actually had a, a mental collapse, and yes. uh, a lot of that forms the subject matter of the lyrics. Um, he comes back and writes lots of the songs. Uh, Markley is clearly still contributing lyrics, 
And although it's a quite an uneven record when it hits a spot, it is... Um, it's absolutely beautiful. It is, it, absolutely. It, it's, it's, uh, I think it's maybe the one I play the most, actually. Oh, yes. I, I get a lot from it. Uh, Little Ruby Rain, perhaps, would be my, my highlight. Gorgeous. But, yeah, mental health problems in the band were there from the start, weren't they? And I just wonder what you think from all of your research. Markley as well at this time... What kind of state him and Sean Harris were in at the time of, of this album? Because it's, it's, it's quite happy, isn't it? Although the lyrics reflect depression and confusion, yeah. it's quite an upbeat record. You have to sort of dig into it to, to get that from it. Well, I, I, yes, I, despite the fact that Dan Harris had been uh, in this very dark place, um, perhaps because of the fact that he had uh, received some help, um, he came back with perhaps a sort of false uh, spirit of optimism. Um, Lloyd was, by that stage, um, about to embark on a hugely successful career uh, as a producer and a songwriter, um, and he was really firing on all cylinders. I mean, it's strange, I suppose, that he came back to, to be so closely involved, but after all, these were his friends. Yes. Uh, even Markley he refers to in that way. Um, he's not someone he bears any ill will towards. Um, and they all seemed to try together to make the best record possible, um, and they largely succeeded. I agree. And I, I, I suspect Lloyd was testing the waters for a more commercial sound, which would, of course, do him great wonders. He worked with the Osmonds. Uh, who else did he work with throughout the 70s? Well, I mean, the Osmonds are perhaps the most uh, of all, uh, and the Dirty Dancing soundtrack yeah. that, that he was uh, closely involved in. But um, uh, we haven't, I think, mentioned the Smoke album, which I no. did mention earlier on, which was um, an album that he recorded whilst he was effectively away from the band. So the Smoke album, which was released in 68 on Tower, uh, and Cyborg Records was uh, his sort of uh, his answer to what the West Coast pop art were doing. And it was yeah. a very successful record and he did musically um, October Country as well October which, Country which, which uh, Cherry Red themselves have reissued on uh, Revola Records exactly. I know you're not so keen on it but it's it's still a, a nicely arranged record oh yes I mean if it, again it, it's, it shows you where he was going it's just that he, he went much further with the Smoke album and sorry I referred to uh, Sean Harris when I was talking about the mental health issues it was Dan Harris Sean Harris later did a, a solo album in the early 70s again reissued on Revola which Although essentially singer-songwriter, it still bears elements of what the West Coast Pop Art Experimental Band were doing a couple of years ago, doesn't yes. it? Yes, I mean, we haven't had time to talk about all of the band's no. uh, different contributions, but uh, I mean, Sean Harris was a phenomenal uh, bass player. Um, as anyone who, who listens to some of the songs like um, Spell of Incense um, and Suppose I Gave a War will, will, will hear. Um, but, you know, he had his own uh, songwriting skills and he was a wonderful singer. Uh, yes. I think a lot of the, the band's sound uh, are really defined by his rather nasal vocals yes. and... Uh, to an almost equal extent by those of his brother. They, they have different voices, though they're very complementary. Um, and this really comes down to, to why the band are so successful, at least to, to my ears, because you have uh, one part of the band who wants to write pop music, who are very good at singing pop music, mm -hmm. uh, very good at playing it. Mm -hmm. You've got um, people like Ron Morgan, who was clearly an astoundingly guitarist, um, and Lloyd, who pretty much was a master of, of all. And then you had Markley constantly dragging them in this different direction with his strange lyrics. And so you get this, uh, this situation where Sean Harris is sometimes singing lyrics. He doesn't like, he doesn't understand, yes. uh, which, fr frankly, freak him out. Like a magnetic force um, pushing away, but just but, about yeah. meeting. But he's singing them nevertheless, you know, yeah. or, or as if he's you know, singing them at gunpoint. Uh, not that he was, of course, but he sounds like someone who's really yes. not comfortable yes. where he is. Now, when you get the right mixture of all those elements together, and I think on A Child's Guide to Good and Evil, it's possibly the, the best fusion of all, yes. um, it, it really is something else. Yes. Yes, it's, it's, um, it's a mixture of emotions, isn't it, that, that I think comes through from this, where, as say, wonderful bands like The Birds, although they had this, it's not as extreme as we get here. We are going to have to draw to a close, everybody, if you're yeah. still watching us. I was going to ask the big question, what became of Bob Markley? Now, maybe Ian McNay will invite us back one day, because in all honesty, that <coughs> could have a whole show dedicated to. It is a very Shakespearean uh, story, which um, tails off rapidly and uh and you could possibly say ends like poor old king lear but we won't go into that here 
Um, Although I should I should say that I now have have, have it on on perfectly uh, good authority that he is dead. Uh, he died in two thousand and three. Uh, I even know where he's buried, just in case. Uh, I had an email last week from a young band who wanted him to produce their new album, which was very touching. But uh, mm. he's not available for work. Okay. So Bob Markley's dead. Um, in all honesty, everybody, if you want to get the the final the final closure, it is in. This uh, issue here, which we have with Rocky Erickson on the front, this has got the last piece of the pop art experimental story. And uh, I'd say the last half of it is a very thorough inspection on um, what became of Bob. And this is the front pages here. And you can really learn everything you want in there. So we won't go into it now. If anybody would like a book written about the West Coast Pop Art Experimental Band, I'm Tim's agent and he's uh, open for <laughs> negotiations. So uh, I think we'll say goodbye and thanks for watching if you uh, have stayed to the end. I had to wear my hat because it's so hot in here. Tim's looking quite healthy under the lights. Thanks, um, Well, thanks, Tim. Good night. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>